getting heavier too. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easy Podcast, where we talk about yeah, yep, cosmic horror, but also weird fiction, general horror, books, movies, games, life advice. Especially that, yeah. Dad joke dad jokes from Carpenter. Hollywood Squares. Yes, the Brady Bunch. And peas. Mm -hmm. Peas on Earth, as Matt said. I did. What are you talking about? Yeah, you did. Uh you know, we're we're Stephen Mark Rainey has recently become a Lovecraft Easing panelist. And one of the reasons for that is is not just his talent, it, but also I really like to surround myself with good people, and, and this is none of this is leading up to a joke. This is I'm serious, and I just have since I've known him, I've always Mark has always seemed to me just to be a really kind, quality person. So uh, I'm glad you're here, Mark. Mark is a, a a panelist but today he's also in the in the he's also a guest you could say and mark edited a book and we'll get into the history of all this titled death realm death realm excuse me spirits edited by stephen mark rainey which i believe for the next couple of days is it still 99 cents on kindle today? it is until uh i think tomorrow tomorrow is the 12th yeah uh through through tomorrow i think okay so if you're watching this a few days from now maybe not or you know three years from now maybe not or maybe it's rolled back to 99 cents again who knows but um if if you're listening watching today you know get you know you can get on it if you're a kindle person today or tomorrow i think so let's let's all introduce ourselves um Pete's going to have questions for you. I, I know Rick will. Uh, oh, I should have said, we've also got three of the writers in the book here today. So welcome, guys, and we'll we'll introduce you guys as well. Um, Two writers, one publisher, actually. Yep. And a partridge in a pear tree. Yep, yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if everything goes well, you know, Pete's going to, Pete's going to field a lot. Pete's going to take care of a lot of questions. And the rest of you are also welcome to do so. I don't know, guys, if you've seen any of these before or listened, but it's very informal. So, and painful. And dangerous, too. Dangerous for your mental health. But, um, but yeah. So if everything goes right, it's as, as the host of the show, it's because of me. If anything goes wrong... It's Pete Rollick's fault. Pete, Pete, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a kind of a good rule of thumb for me ever since I've known Pete, the last thirteen years or so, right? Well, you know, having been married international times, I, I, I'm used to taking abuse and okay, good, you know, good, taking the blame for everything. So, who who's watching the Super Bowl later? I reckon, yeah. Okay. Not sure. I pretend to have something to talk about on the water cooler. Yeah, there you go. Um, I do. Before we get into everything, I do have a Patreon, and I'll keep this short. But the only reason why the Lovecraft Easing, you know, is able to continue is because of the Patreon, and just full stop. That's that's the only reason, only financial reason, I should say. Um. I was using Wikipedia a month or so ago, and I use it quite often, like many of us. And they were doing one of their, you know, I don't know, a couple times a year or, or however often they do it, you know, you know, please pledge three bucks a month or five bucks a month or whatever. If everybody did this, then, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about bills and so forth and, and all that stuff. And you know, I, I've got, I really appreciate the patrons that I have, but if you enjoy this show and you enjoy what, what we do and you want to keep it continue, keep it, what, see it continue. Um, I'll just say it too. If everybody listening to this gave even the minimum five bucks a month on the Patreon, 
then I wouldn't have to sweat every month about my bills for one thing. And you do get a hell of a lot back. I, I, I just posted on the Patreon about this, but I made it an, uh, a, uh, uh, post that everyone could see. Um, we just inter just interviewed uh, Sandy Peterson. This is sort of like some of my favorites that I posted, and it gives you a good idea of the kind of stuff that we do. Uh, Paul Trimbley and I discussed the Stephen King multiverse. Um, John Langan, his life and work, plus John's advice for writers. Jeff Ford said when that came out, a year or so back that that's that alone was worth the price of the um, the patreon and um, all of this starts at five bucks a month that you get all of the the podcasts and then at 10 bucks a month you get more features plus hanging out with the panelists twice a month and then you can you can click on the patreon and find out the higher features but the very highest you can be a guest panelist um the third highest yeah no mark did not pay me to be a guest panelist i just asked him um <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll say that's true yeah and um if you're at the second highest level you get you get free print books and a lot of other things so i hope you consider it and that's that's all i have to say i i i even i'm not good at talking about this stuff but i have to because it's like I said, this is the only way it continues. So we're going to talk to Stephen Mark Rainey and company about Death Realm Spirits, which is a new anthology that Mark edited. For those of you who don't know Stephen Mark Rainey, uh, you'll find him under that at Amazon and, and other book websites, but he goes by Mark. So let's do introductions and then let's let's talk about this. I'm Mike Davis. And this is my show. And if I did it alone, it would be boring. So I appreciate all my panelists and guests. Uh, DeBronzo, why don't you go next? Hey, I'm Mike DeBronzo, architect and artist and a Patreon. Don't you want to be one too? Very good. I like that. There you go. You know, Victor Laval is a patron. His Patreon. Yeah, yeah. He is. Totally worth it, guys. Do it. All right. Anyway. Sales talk over. Sorry. Um, Rick. Rick Lay, writer and pulp magazine collector. Carpenter, you got a prize? Hi, I'm Mike, you son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, mind. Uh, so uh, we have a prize today. It's actually a nice one. It's the first six issues of the Hedge Knight comic by George R. R. Martin. Uh, I put a picture on the Facebook easing main page. Uh if you want to win this prize, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com. Put hedge in the subject heading. We'll draw a winner about six weeks. Who knows? It might be you. Uh, I also run movie night. And last night we watched a very interesting Korean supernatural movie called The Ghost Station. So you guys enjoyed it? Yeah, it was actually Koreans do ghost stories good. I just got to say. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very enjoyable. Not very long. It's only like 80 minutes, which shows you don't need two and a half hours to pack a punch. Right. Um, Pete. Hey, uh, Pete Rollick. Um, this is Mike's show, and but he's really, really boring. So <laughs> he's asked a whole bunch of people here to try and, you know, make it a little bit more livelier. And uh, we're know, here to help. We're yeah, here to help, really. I, you know, makes me feel warm inside. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate yeah. that. That's also, the acid reflux, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it goes hand in hand with this drinking problem. Oh, jeez. I wish I had a drinking problem. <laughs> it's You get, you drink, you get drunk, you fall down. There's no problem. That's exactly. Exactly. Uh, Mark. Okay. I'm Stephen Mark Rainey. Go by Mark editor author been in the business for going on 40 40 years now and uh i'll get into the history of death realm or whatever you want to talk about whenever but uh, uh i'm i'm keeping myself busy writing and editing yeah 
Anthony Trimbley, you want to introduce yourself? Tony. Tony. Uh, yeah. I've been writing for about 20 years. I've got uh, two novels out, two collections, and a whole bunch of short stories. Uh, and a brand new novel coming out this July. Uh, and I've also edited uh, three anthologies. What's the name of your novel that, that's coming up? It's called uh, The Damage Done. Uh, okay. And it's centered, like my other two novels, it's a standalone novel, but it's centered where I live in Gosstown, New Hampshire. And it's folk horror. Folk horror. Yeah. Um, great. Are, are all three of them? No. Well, no, the first, well, they, I guess you could consider them folk horror, but the first two have to uh, are pretty much deal with possession, Catholic Church, religion. Uh, the third one takes a uh, big detour. Uh, into oh small town living uh, and possession of a different sort. It's got some South Korean influence in it, uh, folk tales, that type of thing. And where can we find your work? It, it, is it best to go to Amazon and type in Tony Trimbley, or do you have a website you oh. where either point to? Or... I've got both. I've got a website, but the easiest thing to do, you can go to the website, you can go to uh, Amazon. David down there, uh, I say down there, he's on the lower left-hand column for me, has published both my collections uh, with Crossroad Press. And the three novels will be from Havel House Press. Well, that's a great segue to David, then. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, David? Um, I've been in the business just about the same length of time as Mark, I think. I have somewhere around 40 books published in just about every weird genre you can think of. Um own Crossroad Press. I used to do a magazine called The Tome back when Mark started Death Realm. We were kind of at the same time. That's pretty much how we met was at early yep. horror conventions. And now I have Crossroad Press with about 3,000 titles and over 1,000 audio books and growing every day. Uh, how and long is... Twelve cats. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have six, so we've got half the number that you have. So That was just um... in case they popped their head up. Right. Well, um, how long has Crossroads Press been in existence? I think it's our 13th year. Okay. Like that. We started out, it was just going to be me. I was just going to put my books out as ebooks. And a couple of people I knew didn't know how to do that and saw that I did and said, Can you do that for my books? And I said, Not for free. And uh, the next thing I knew, it, it was really the growth was astronomical at the beginning. I mean, just huge backlists of stuff. We, we currently got all of a uh, a bunch of Clive Barker's old stuff back in audio. We've got most of Brian Lumley's ebooks and everything as it comes down from other big publishers. We've been picking up Brian's stuff. Um, That's impressive. Just crazy. He even let me use his uh, um, Titus Crow in one of my stories recently. So Are, it was a real honor. Do you mean uh, things that aren't yet in Kindle? Um, you're making them, them available in Kindle or is it a total republish both um his stuff is um i mean the necroscope stuff probably not going to come down from from whoever has that mm -hmm. in paperback and in kindle but just about everything else we've got the titus crow books we've got the um audio for everything um and we were lucky enough to snag simon vance who's like a world-class audiobook narrator to do that so those have been huge for us you know there there's a thing that happens where a book goes out of print and you know everyone has a copy and you can't get a copy unless you want to shell out 150 bucks or whatnot so you know especially if it's not available in kindle and then you make it available in kindle and you and or audio book format and you're really doing a wonderful service for the horror readers out there no oh, so. i hope so we we just picked up mark morris another author that doesn't seem to have had his books put back out. And I had no idea how many books that guy had. And they're all about 400 pages. So that's fun. And how do we find Crossroads Press online? We have um, crossroadpress.com. We also have a Blue Sky account. Um, drop Twitter for Elon reasons. Yeah. Um, we've got a Facebook page and a, a newsletter through Beehive that we are very, very much trying to get better at putting out regularly. Did you say um, the URL is Crossroads Press or is no, it no, no S? 
Crossroads. And there's a, there's a good reason for that because there is a publisher at Crossroads Press and they're a very old, very distinguished religious publishing company. And we have crossed some emails and some questions over the years that have been pretty amusing. <laughs> <laughs> they're all pretty, pretty good sports about it, but some of the stuff. Yeah, I bet. So, uh, Alan, could you tell us about yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Alan Lestufka. I'm definitely the new kid on the block. I've only been writing and publishing for about the last two, two and a half years. Um, I run Shortwave Publishing, uh, which is the company that published Death Realm and a lot of other books. Um, and uh, my debut novel came out in March of 2022, and it was called Face the Night. And I am working on my second book now. What's Face the Night about? Um, it's about a police sketch artist uh, who can only draw the same face over and over and over again, and it's not the face that's being described to her. And so that kicks off an uh, uh, investigation and a mystery that she needs to solve. That's an interesting premise. I like that. Thanks. And um, so you published Death Realm Spirits, and just quickly, what else have has been going on as far as publishing? Uh, we have a series of standalone novellas called the Killer VHS series. That's our most popular line. Um, each of those is inspired by an old 70s, 80s horror film, um, but kind of, I mean, they're all original properties. They're just inspired by. Right. Um, I've done a couple other anthologies, including Obsolescence, which I edited with my friend Christina Horner. Um, that was our first anthology. And um, we have a book from David coming up later this year. Uh, we have a new book from Nat Cassidy coming up later this year, uh, Clay McLeod Chaplin. So um, very full schedule this year, but very excited about the titles. Yeah, those are two great guys. Clay was just on two weeks ago. Uh, with He's Todd fantastic Teasley. to work with. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great conversation with those two. So um, how do we how do we find shortwave publishing online? Uh, you can go to shortwavepublishing.com or we're on all social media as shortwave books. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. All right. So, uh, as I said, at least as I speak, this is 99 cents on Kindle, but you know, it's available in print as well. And I'm speaking for those who are listening, not watching, talking about death realm spirits edited by Stephen Mark Rainey. And, um, Let's talk about this. Um, why did you want to publish this book, Mark? And what is the history of Death Realm? Uh, because there's a lot of history there. Now, I'm going to kind of turn over, turn this over to Pete. So whoever wants to start with that and go from there. So. Okay. Well, I started Death Realm back in 1980 seven uh i had uh, i had started writing stories you know sending them out to small press publications and stuff like that and in i lived in chicago at the time and i think it was once a month bob weinberg put on this little mini con thing it was just a dealer's room but at the americana congress hotel if i remember and i started going down to that and he had all these fantastic small press publications, a lot of Lovecraftian stuff. And I was already a big Lovecraft fan. So mm -hmm. I found stuff like Crypt of Cthulhu and um, uh, Jessica Salmison had a couple of uh, titles out. And I started thinking, you know, I wouldn't mind doing something like this. And uh, at the time, I was product manager at a uh, manufacturer of uh, typesetting systems for uh, ad agency so these multi-million dollar typesetting machines and one of my jobs was to troubleshoot the new machines to you know run as many pages as i could test pages through these printers and see what their tolerances were see if i could break the machines that kind of thing and so i got to think well why not just start running out like real pages so i started typesetting <laughs> pages for death row magazine you know at first it started out i solicited a few stories from people that I had become acquainted with. And I put a couple of my own in there, but at that time it was the, literally the only small press magazine with basically uh, professional quality typesetting. And these days, I don't know if anybody even understands what a novelty that was. Most, most magazines were just slapped together with, you know, typewritten pages that were 
mimeographed and if and if they had a big budget printed offset. So um, the first couple of issues, uh, I got them into a few like the comic distributors. There was what was uh, Bud Plant was one way back then and mm-hmm. Diamond and um i had i had had some publishing experience with a godzilla magazine called japanese giants but that sort of led the way into uh death roman uh, so i was able to start out you know kind of with a bang got the publication in front of a lot of people it attracted a lot of attention especially a story in the first issue called encyclopedia for boys by jeff osier who was a friend of mine from chicago a brilliant story and to this day, I mean, I really believe that story more than anything else put Death Realm on the map. Uh, it's sad that Jeff, uh, I say it's sad, to me it's sad, he has basically retired from writing. He does art. He's a great artist, too, but he put writing aside some years back, else he probably would have been in Death Realm spirit. But Death Realm ran from uh, 1987 to 1997 uh, for the first what five or six years i published it independently on my own and then uh another fellow who wanted to actually publish a uh, a title a small press title of his own and he seemed to have fairly deep pockets and knew a lot of uh, about distribution and stuff like that uh towel was his name so he um published several issues and then uh, we parted company after a while because our editorial visions kind of diverged. And then a partnership of uh, Terry Rossio's screenwriter. He wrote like, uh, uh, what was it? A uh, bunch of stuff for Disney. He did Pirates of the Caribbean later. And, uh, you know, he, he had a lot of credits and apparently a lot of money. So he and uh, novelist uh, Lawrence Watt Evans formed a partnership and, for several years they they were the official publishers of death realm but uh this was in you know the 90s were winding down desktop publishing was changing everything was the whole face of publishing was starting to change um distributors were going bankrupt by the score so by the end of the run i think we had well what was it fine print distributors i think it was went bankrupt they they supplied to barnes and noble and books a million you know a lot of the big chains and they went bankrupt owing us to the tune of like twenty thousand dollars and there was no way we could just suck that up so we decided to retire we decided to retire death realm on a high note we paid off all the debts you know finished up all the material that i had on hand uh and for several years thereafter you know i think a lot of people remembered Death Realm is as something of a of a powerhouse in the small press field. Um, in fact, until uh, you know, for years, for years, I would continue to get submissions to Death Realm, and I think the last submission I got to Death Realm was in two thousand nine. <laughs> you know, I was like, some of these people are really out of the loop. But uh, yeah, twelve years then, later, yeah. Then several years back, I. Uh, you know, when I go to cons or talk to other writers and all, and the single biggest question was, are you ever going to resurrect Death Realm? And I'm like, well, not as a magazine. I could never go back into that high pressure schedule of, of getting it out. But I did think the idea of maybe floating it as an anthology would work. And so I um, I approached several publishers with it. And we, I had one who was very, very interested in it. They had done a couple of my collections. I won't. Well, I won't go saying names here, but uh, I actually, uh, I was waiting on the day I was waiting for the contract to arrive uh, for Death Realm instead of a contract. I got a letter from them and they said they were having to, you know, they had hit hard times. They were cutting back titles, cutting back titles, and they just weren't going to be able to move forward with, with Death Realm. So that was disappointing, but in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that could have happened because I think the book would have just, it would have either fallen by the wayside or gotten buried or something. And uh, so in more recent days, I started just, I don't know. I, I, last year I went to author con in Williamsburg and uh, you know, I got to talking to a lot of authors and I thought, man, maybe this is the time 
to uh, try to resurrect Death Roman. I talked to Dave Wilson here, and uh, he recommended uh, he knew Alan, and he said Alan's doing just a massively bang up job on his books and stuff. Why don't you talk to Alan? So I talked to Alan, and we quickly came to a consensus that. The timing was probably good. We had uh, we had a lot of resources we could put to putting out a first class book. And initially, I was going to make it half invite and half open it to submissions. But at that time, my wife and I were in the process of moving. We had more catastrophes happen than uh, I would ever want to go into. But it, as it turned out, I. I didn't have the time or energy to try to read submissions. And uh, I think it was Alan later said, you know, he opened up for what a week and a thousand stories came in in a week. And I'm like, no, I, I, I can't do that. So uh, I'd, I'd say people will remember death realm. All right. And I, I resurrecting it as a book, as an anthology was a really great way to answer that question and make the fans happy. Yeah, I, I I hope so. You know, we got some really good talent in this book, and I got good work from them. Uh, and I tended to work pretty closely with most of them, you know, because I, in a lot of cases, I tend to be a fairly hands-on editor. But at the end of it all, it feels like we we whipped this book into really good shape. Uh, Alan did a beautiful job. You know, like he found. Uh, a cover artist and you know he and i both have graphic experiences i was i was a long time uh graphics person so between us we came up with designs that you know thought looked incredible so i think it looks good i think it reads good and uh as a you know we had this book bub deal going and as of per, uh, what was it thursday was it thursday it came out anyway in three day for three days it held the number one uh sales slot in three categories you know three key categories for us so uh we got bumped by stephen king for like two hours and then we bumped <laughs> it then we went back to number one so <laughs> you know, we were uh we're, we're hoping that's going to be a real feather in our cap to uh yeah uh, Pete, get Pete, out i know you had some comments and questions as well well the, you, the, mark just ran through every no <laughs> through a lot I mean, he covered the history of Death Realm really, really well. But what I, I think he glossed over was the fact that, you know, these glossy little magazines really set a new standard for your competitors. That this was a, a, imitated a lot by people like Tailbones. Um if if anything, you had this huge impact on on not only the quality of the appearance of the book, but the content as well. There's some great stuff in here, and some of it I don't know that it's ever been reprinted. I I know you know some of the stuff in there, depending on the authors, you know they'll include them in collections, and uh, you know some some of them appeared in. Uh, Carter Wagner's best of and Ellen Ellen Datlow's best of, you know. Um, so, uh, but a lot of the, um, a lot of those writers were first timers and may not have progressed beyond submitting to Death Realm, but what they produced was great. You know, I, I loved it. That's why it actually appeared there. And, I, you know, some of them, I know for a fact, a, a good many of them did actually kind of fall by the wayside, but. A lot of them uh, also went on to really build big careers for themselves. A lot of the people who first got published in Death Realm or, you know, some of the other small press are really, uh, they're, they're prominent still today. So I'm looking at what, issue 11 from spring 1990. And buried in here in the poetry section is a poem by Jeff Vandermeer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jeff had several stories in Death Realm, as yeah. a matter of fact. Um. And, you know, when I was reading this, and you're right, I bought it at my comic book store in college. Um, this is the first place I read Willem Pugmire and Fred Chappelle. Um, uh, I think Wayne Allen Sally was it? 
Yeah. Oh, a lot. He was in there a lot. Yeah. Um, it you did this thing where you introduced or gave new writers an opportunity, and you, you know, I I read the um the little history you did early earlier um on the website, and you talk about how you needed a place to put you know ten thousand word short stories. But yeah, yeah. Just, just as there were longer pieces than you would find in in other magazines, there were also shorter pieces. There are a lot of mood pieces. There's a lot more poetry in here than I thought in other other magazines. How did you how did you find that nice balance between long pieces, short pieces, and you know I've done some editing, so like poetry is is sometimes it's filler, but sometimes it's you find stuff that's really really important. Yeah, that was one of the advantages, I think, of uh, at that time, you know, just I solicited some work, but most of it came in via blind submissions. And a lot of uh, a lot of people, you know, when they saw that I did occasionally run a little poetry, you know, every every dark poet in the world seemed to uh, fill my mailbox. But I just, I had a smorgasbord of what I took to be first rate poetic work and you know whenever something and and to me more so than a story i mean a story certainly has to hit me emotionally but for me poetry is almost all an emotional hook okay. and a lot of the stuff that i published it it just happened to hit the right buttons can i ask a question absolutely yeah. mark how do you edit poetry uh, not the way I would edit a story. It's very rare that um, I can't even think back on any specific changes or edits or modifications I ever even asked for. Maybe I did. Uh, I had a little more hair back in those days. It's it, and I think they carried a lot of brain cells when they left. But I don't <laughs> remember specifically editing content certainly maybe maybe a format from time to time if you will line line break a little bit different space a little bit different what whatever but usually those things uh uh like i said best as i can recall the way they were published was more or less how they came to me yeah you know how poetic joe pulver's work was oh yeah 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 not writing poetry but just the work itself was so po poetic and even the spaces on the page, you know, were, were done deliberately by him. And so he sent me a couple of stories one time and said, you know, you can, can you edit these a little bit? I was like, no, I don't know how to edit your stuff, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I, yeah, poetry is a real different ball game to edit. So. Yeah. Um, one of the, um, it, it, not so much about death room, but Joe back years ago, um, um, Robert M. Price, you know, lived not, not far from me. And Joe would come down from, uh, where was he? New Jersey, I think. And, uh, he'd come down and spend a long weekend or something like that. So I would drive over and back in those days, I smoked cigarettes and Joe smoked cigarettes. So we would sit out on Bob's front porch and Joe and I would shoot the shit for a couple of hours at a time. And he, he was such a fascinating character. And I wish to God that I had had a chance to publish his work. Um, I was not publishing anything, you know, during that period where we knew each other and when he was, uh, you know, still living and producing. I published the very last book of his um, I'm sure more will be maybe I, I don't know the very last book that he wrote right before he died um, and was published before he died although I'm not sure that he realized it at that point you know so uh, I'm, I'm happy about that and he was very fascinating to talk to so yeah he was a regular uh, on your show wasn't he for a quite, yeah. a, quite a while from the beginning and he and I we're really good friends as well as he was friends with, you know, Pete and Matt and many others, but he and I would spend, 
you know, we would not every day, but it seemed like every other day we'd spend an hour uh, talking on video chat face to face like this, you know, so I, I really miss him. One, sometimes I would send him a email and said, Hey, I want to ask you about this. And instead of replying with the answer, he would reply with five minutes, five exclamation points. I'm going to get some tea, 10 exclamation points, you know, and then we'll video chat it's 30 exclamation points. So yeah, I miss him. But anyway, Pete, anything yeah, else? So, all right. So how does, I, I think you, you touched on a little bit, but how does death realm, the magazine become death realm, the, the book um, in terms was, is it all just reprints or did you solicit? Yeah. Now there was a there was an anthology called Death Realms with an S at the end. That uh, what was that early two thousands? I think from Delirium Press, and it was reprints. It was uh, I don't remember how many stories were in it. Beautifully pr produced. Uh, it was a limited edition hardback, um, so it didn't have huge circulation or anything but uh it it was a a gorgeous book and i think it had some of death realm's strongest work and for me trying to pick out strongest work from death realm that was uh that was no small task um for death realm spirits um like i said before i uh what i ended up doing was uh basically uh going after a few writers that I already knew that I wanted to submit writers that I, uh, maybe not knew, but I knew of their work. Uh, I had some recommendations like I had never read Eric LaRocca or Richard Thomas before. And I think Alan suggested some Dave Wilson suggested some. So I started looking into their stuff. I'm like, Holy cow, I've got to get these people in here. And, uh, those worked out very well when, uh, uh Brian Keene was uh, high on the list. I've, I've known Brian for quite a while. And he, the first time I met him, I believe was in 2007 at Horrifying in Baltimore, if I'm not mistaken. And, and he actually sought me out to tell me he had never been published in Death Row. I, he had sent me a bunch of work, but I I hadn't used it. It didn't, didn't hit me right at the time. But I always, one, one of the things I did always try to do in those days when I could was write a personalized rejection, give somebody some personal feedback on it. And he sought me out to tell me that that feedback that he'd gotten from my rejections pushed him to go harder and harder and to write better and better. And so when I asked him if he wanted to uh, contribute to Death Realm Spirits, uh, he he kind of squalled and he's like, of course I want to. <laughs> he's like, after all these fucking years, I'm going to get to be in Death Realm. So. That's a nice story. I like that. Yeah. yeah. But I, I have, I, I will say I have had a lot of people over the years, even if whether they were in the book or didn't make it into the book that uh, I did, like I said, I tried to communicate deeply with authors because being one, I always appreciated when I felt like I was, uh, that what I was sending out wasn't going into a black hole, you know, and that I could, uh, uh, I could I could be an approachable uh, an approachable editor I guess but you know I consider these people my peers I wanted their respect and so I tried to make the magazine and what I did I wanted I wanted to be respectable and respectful. Uh, Pete, any quest any more questions for for Mark? But not only Mark, but uh, our other guests as well, if you'd like. Last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Pete go is ahead. this. No, no, no. You go go for it. No, no. I just want to say you're a lot of people call you Mr. Death Realm at cons and so forth. Can I call you to. Death or do I need to no, address you as Mr. Death Realm? No, I don't think Death would uh would smile <laughs> upon that. But uh <laughs> yeah, for years I was pretty well known as Mr. Death Realm in convention circles and stuff like that. But you know, there was a long enough gap in in a death realm being published in any form that, you know, it feels like there's a whole generation out there that didn't even know what death realm was. So I don't think anybody's 
call me Mr. Death Realm in a pretty good while, except as an insult or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Pete. Go ahead. So riffing off that, I, I think that there's a, a whole generation of people who don't know what a, a, a prosine is. You, you know, there's there's very few left. And, you know, if, I mean, there's what, fantasy and science fiction, Asimov, analog. What's doing horror these days? I think, uh, well, Cemetery Dance is sort of out there. I mean, they've sort got, of. a you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of publications, but, you know, certainly like the magazine was, uh, I, I hesitate to call it Death Realm's competition. I guess we competed to an extent, but Rich was always so gracious and uh he supported death realm very much in uh in a lot of ways and you know i uh he published a bunch of my work and so we i don't know that we felt competitive but these days i i think didn't a new i think a new um uh, issue of cemetery dance is on its way out and i did see that someplace so I it's not that. you know it's not the regular publication that it used to be but it still looks like uh uh, it's alive and kicking and, and presenting a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of good work. Okay. Um, so who Tony is in the book? Is yes. In the, yes. So Tony, tell us about your story, your inspirations and working oh, with Mark. Now, before we start, I just want to give a shout out to, uh, shortwave, uh, Mark mentioned how great the cover was, and it's a wonderful cover. Uh, but they really went all out on this uh, anthology. The box it came in, I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but this actually came into a box. Uh, oh, wow. Just beautiful. Uh, and it obviously protected the paperback. But it was just really kind of a cool thing to get. Yeah. Uh, nice, you, Alan. That's great. Oh, and you open the package. And the other thing that... Uh, Shortwave did is they had a website with all the authors on a little bios on, on all the authors and I'd never seen that before. Uh, it was a great job. I don't know how he got all the information, but he did. Uh, and I made it all up. You did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to thank uh, Alan Shortwave. You, you guys did a, a great job, uh, and I'm very proud to be a part of this anthology. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, we, we do those boxes, uh, branded boxes like that for our major releases, because um, as you said, it protects them. Uh, it also looks good. Um, it's great for social media posts because people love showing off the boxes when they get them for book exactly. mail versus just a plain cover. Great um, point. And yeah, I, th I think that, you know, whether an author can print something with us, that's a short story or a novella or a novel. Uh, I like to treat those things the same way. So everyone does get a bio on the website. You know, we have over a hundred authors on there now. We've only been around for two years. Um, Cause yeah, like if somebody wants to read more of your work, I want them to be able to find you and find the rest of your work, you know? And I think that that's important. So we, we make uh, strides to include everyone. Well, thank you. You did a, a wonderful job of above and beyond with a lot of anthologies too. Uh, my, uh, my story is called roadblock. The one that's in, uh, spirits and just to give you a little background uh, Mark asked me if I wanted to be part of this and he said hey it's a Lovecraft related book and I didn't know much about Lovecraft I mean I'd read him many many years ago and I always had a tough time uh, the, the prose was very thick uh, it didn't come easy to me uh, so I didn't really get into it that much but I knew of it I knew what Lovecraft was and and how he wrote and again, I did read some of the stuff, but my understanding of, of what Lovecraft is, is from reading other authors that wrote in Love, Lovecraft's vein. And, you know, Mark is certainly an example of somebody that, uh, you know, has a lot of Lovecraft, Lovecraft influence. Uh, David did on a couple of his uh, novels that I've read. Uh, Bracken McLeod, uh, Jim Moore, Charles Rutledge. Uh, there's so many people out there that Pete Rollick. I'm sorry. Pete yeah. Rollick, too. <laughs> no, but he did. Yeah, I know. Ignore him. <laughs> Ignore me. Uh, 
but all those between talking to all or excuse me reading all these different uh, stories and novels i got a really good appreciation for cosmic horror uh and one of the things that i associated with cosmic horror was tentacles i <laughs> i mean uh, you know mike mark read this i keep calling you mike i'm sorry mark read this great story i uh, wrote this great story about this couple that goes to a, uh, an inn in wine country to do some wine tasting and there's something in the basement uh and it you know it was tentacles it was just so good uh and it made an impression on me so when uh, mark called me or, or emailed me and said hey you know I'm, I'm starting this up would you like to have a story and i said "Ooh, yeah okay i i, th I think i can do it uh and I, I i think i took about a month uh 30 days which is what it normally takes me to write a short story uh and i and i sent it to mark and uh he, he said he wanted the story bad. He wanted to edit it bad, <laughs> which was fine. Uh, and then uh, between the both of us, uh, he accepted it and it went into the anthology. Yeah, well, it was, it was a great tale. Um, I had read uh, a couple of Tony's novels, and I loved the atmosphere. And I figured if if Tony can translate some of his atmosphere uh, – you know condensed into the into a short story then that's going to be a, what i consider a death realm story it it, it uh, to me I, I can't define a death realm story it's a feel it's it's intuitive but i think tony nailed it with it as you know in as much as possible i think any of the stories i published you you put them all together and it creates an over arcing atmosphere or mood that the book has and all of the stories that I published, uh, Dave, Tony's, you know, it, uh, their components in, in a, uh, in the feel of the book, I think. Mm -hmm. so, so David, do you want to tell us about your story? Yeah. Um, I was really happy to have this story get into this book. Um, it, it had become available from a market that looked to me like it was going to go dive down before the, story ever saw the light of day and you know absolutely love this story i think this might be the fastest acceptance that i have ever gotten <laughs> <laughs> i've read a lot of dave's work and i've i've loved a lot of dave's work but i felt like this story was the best thing i'd ever read of dave's it i mean i read it and i said this thing's in there twice over man it was yeah i loved it <laughs> Yeah, um, so to be clear, this it's Death Realm Spirits. It's a anthology of ghost stories. It's not necessarily. It's got it's got a wide range of types okay. of stories. I definitely wanted to have some that had a Lovecraftian feel, but the initially I was going to call it. I, I think it was Death Realm Resurrection, and I thought oh, it just seems a little trite. Let's see what else I can come up with. And I thought <laughs> Spirit sort of gives it the the sense of, you know, it's it's come after. It's an afterlife. And so okay. it, correspondingly, it was not a guideline or not a not a rule. It was more of a suggestion. I said I'd really like to see ghostly stories, stories that focus on atmosphere on supernatural themes and okay. every writer took those in a different direction and uh that that's kind of how they relate to the title i felt oh, my gosh. my story was one that if you were still publishing death realm the magazine it absolutely would have been the first place that i sent this because it's it's so much like other things that i sent there before that i had good luck with and things that i didn't i i might be one of the people who sent mark more stories in a row that did not make it into death realm until I sat down and wrote one um, from my reflection darkly that I said, I'm going to write a story that is exactly for death realm. <laughs> and I think that was the first one he took. Turned out to be. <laughs> well, I, I, I see, I think if I'm remembering right, I read a story of Dave's, the first story of his that I'd read, one in a vampire story, I think. Yeah. And I'm after like, hours. Yeah. Yeah. I thought this is a fantastic story. I actually kind of wrote him a fan letter. And uh, so I'm freaked out. <laughs> yeah, when uh, uh, when I started getting stories from Dave, after I that's the thing I had read that first story of his, and I'm like, it's got to be at least that good. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and you got there. No kidding. Yeah. I have at least one story that was in your magazine that became a novel later. Yeah. So which one is that? The, the, the listeners. In his Heart Live Dragons is the name of the novel. Okay. Um, it's one of my Donovan De Chance series books, but it's about a, a kid who he was an artist, an artist, a poor kid in, in a barrio in San Valencia, California, that I made up. And uh, he started painting dragons on the back of some bikers' leather jackets. And it sort of um, joined them with an actual dragon in another dimension at the same time that a voodoo priestess was gearing up a different gang to do some bad things and ended up in a big confrontation. But uh, that came from the small short story that was in Death Realm many many moons ago with a really cool illustration yeah the in fact the cover art uh yeah was based on on your story for that i think it was what 25 issue 25 i think something like that was way up there in the newer ones yeah mm -hmm. when they were full size and yeah color covers and such yeah so uh as a book collector and and i have to ask alan where did you come up with the idea of decorating the box that you ship these books in? Cause it just from a book lover's viewpoint, it's just another piece of ephemera that has to go and stay with the book. Right. So, yeah, I mean the, the, so I'm very um, picky about conditions of things. And so for me, it was first and foremost, how do we protect these books when we ship them out? I was right. tired of getting books from Amazon where the corners were danged or, you know, there was already a crease in the back cover, et cetera. And so I thought, okay, let's go with boxes. Uh, so I started looking into boxes because I wanted to get the right sizes and all that kind of stuff. And it turned out that the custom boxes are only a little bit more than like normal craft blank cardboard boxes. So sure. for an extra, you know, 40, 50 cents a box, we can have them branded with our logo and our website and the cover design and all this kind of stuff. And so from a marketing standpoint, it just made sense to me, especially with Bookstagram and Book Talk and all these things. Let's give the readers something to show off. Let's give them something that's more than what they're expecting. And it's only costing me an extra 50 cents over what it would cost me to ship them a blank box um, to make sure they get the book in a good condition. And uh, that's kind of evolved. Like I started with just shortwave branded boxes. Um, so they, they looked nice, had our logo, um, that kind of stuff. And then as we started doing more um, bigger titles, uh, you know, I thought, well, let's, let's actually brand this box just for this title. I think the first one that was branded was the the anthology that I edited um, with Christina uh, Obs Obsolescence, um, which was our fourth, fifth publication, I think. And it was a way for uh, me to introduce shortwave to the author community, because, again, I'm, I'm very new. I came into this not really knowing anyone. I wanted to publish my own book. I researched how to publish that book. I did it and sales were fantastic. They were so great that I was like, okay, I'm going to help other people do this. Um, I come from a background of design. So design's always been really important to me with the layout. Um, I noticed a lot of small press books were kind of lacking on the design side. Um, so that's one thing that's kind of helped shortwave stand out a little bit um, is that, you know, I do all, most of our cover art. Uh, I do all of our interiors. Um, we occasionally work with illustrators on the interior for illustrations and stuff. And just, it's all about the packaging to me, like um, the whole presentation in total, I guess. So I think that giving them more than just a book and so including the bookmarks, including the boxes, including postcards with some of them have unique postcard designs or stickers or whatever. Um, it's a lot of fun, both for the author and for the reader. And again, it's really helped us with um, standing out, I think, from the pack. You know, it's like anyone can start a small press these days. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of um know how because things are so simple these days compared to even just 20 years ago um that you really need something to stand out because there are people starting small presses every other month you know um and i didn't want to be just another one of those small presses um i wanted us to have a, a an identity uh a brand um a following for lack of a better word um and uh i think that the boxes help with that uh and it also gives you a pristine paperback when you get it so Alan, quick question before um, Pete continues, but the listeners may be wondering at this point, if we order Death Realm Spirits, you know, print copy, do we still get that the, that extra stuff or was that just the first wave or, or what? Uh, there are still boxes available. They won't be available for forever, but I would say right. that we probably have somewhere around 80 copies left of the box. 
Um, yeah, we nice. we print we print the branded boxes in limited runs for each title, and then they just default back to shortwave boxes once we run out of the the specifically branded titles. Cool. Okay, great. Um, so Tony mentioned your, the website with all the authors associated with the book on it. And I, and I think you explained it's like your your whole publishing company. You every author gets a little a blurb, right? So is how's that how's that work? Is that is there a a link on the back of the book or? Well, so yeah, if you go to just shortwavepublishing.com, which is on sure. the book, um, there's an authors tab at the top. And then we have every single author we've ever published, no matter how small or how big, um, has their own page. So okay. it'll include an author photo, a bio. It'll include uh, the cover art and links for every book that we've published by them, every magazine story we've published by them. It includes links to all the news articles that have come out about them. So anytime we get a Kirkus review or Publishers Weekly review, we'll put up a, a news post about that. Um, so it's just a great way to collect everything about that author as far as it relates to shortwave. And that's all available on the website. Yeah. I that's thought it was amazing. nice too that that you put my photo up and you didn't scratch it out, you know, and where it was uh, unrecognizable. Or put tentacles on. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you're just giving me ideas for the next update. So, it really is. I, I really, I'm impressed. I mean, I know how hard running a small press and or, and or magazine is. You know, I was I was I was nodding my head when Mark was talking about how hard it is, and when you were talking just now, I just wow, he's doing it, and he's doing a great job. Alan's doing a great job. And he's doing all these extra things. And it's those things that it's one of the things that really set you apart because people do have a lot of choices about on what to read and what to buy. And so, so yeah, I'm, I just wanted to say, I applaud you for doing all that. Thank you. As an, as an author, it's really cool too, because like, like you said earlier, I have a book coming out later this year and I am dying to see what the cover and the design, the boxes, all that stuff. It's exciting for me because I don't so much publishing over the last few years and did so many series works that I've been working on that I just have had a lot of new original stuff come out. This year is going to be good for me. And that's the one I'm most excited about. That's awesome. Um, going back to Mark, because uh, Tony touched on how he didn't know much about Lovecraft at all. But Mark, we'd never talked to you about like, where does your Lovecraft influence come from? How did you get started with Lovecraft? Um, I unlike a lot of my my peers, I well, I knew of Lovecraft as a young person, and I think I saw like the movie, The Dunwich Horror, you know, in nineteen seventy. But I had never read Lovecraft until I was, uh, I think, I was actually a senior in college, and a friend of mine had a bunch of the old Ballantine uh, Lovecraft volumes, you know, they had the the faces and, you know, the wicked looking faces. So he just gave me those thinking, yeah, you know, you like scary stuff. You might, you might enjoy these. So I read um, several stories in one night. I remember reading, not all of them were Lovecraft, but it was in the, like the tales of the Thulu mythos. And I remember reading, uh, uh, Notebook Found in a Deserted House by Robert Block, uh, mm. The Haunter of the Dark by Lovecraft, and a couple others. I can't remember specifically. Whisper in Darkness was one, I think. But over a couple of days, uh, I read those. And at the time, I was at uh, University of Georgia, and I lived in a house with five other people out in the sticks, way out in the country outside of Athens. And uh, the night that I was reading those, I was the only person in the house. And as soon as I turned off the light, I was like, I haven't been scared like this since I was about five years old. <laughs> you know, you know, it was dark outside. There were woods outside and a lot of critters making noise and stuff like that. And here I was, I think, what, 21 years old. And I felt like I was 10, you know, after watching a scary movie, uh, back when I, I was love a kid it. so yeah so i knew that this was something i wanted that i that i was smitten with it so i so, read so, everything i could get my hands on as far as lovecraft went so, so mark it's interesting that you say that because 
when I'm reading, I mostly don't get scared. I mean, mm -hmm. hardly ever. But there's two circumstances reading a story where I actually had this intense thrill of fear. And one is a book that you wrote. I swear it's this. I don't even want to give it away. The book's like old now. It's Baylock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was my first full length novel. Yeah. There's this scene where two women are talking. And suddenly one is alone. And the way it was written, I just, wow, I was like, like really, I, I almost practically jumped. It's like, that's one of the very, very few times. It's funny you say it was Lovecraft. You did that to me. <laughs> well, yay. Cool. <laughs> it's always good the, to scare Matt. <laughs> what was the other one, Matt? Oh, um, I was reading, it was one thirty or 2 in the morning. I must have been 13 or 14. I was reading Winged Death one summer night. We didn't have air conditioning, so I had the windows open, and a big black boss flew in the room, went up to my light fixture, crawled inside it, and disappeared. Never to be seen again, and I I freaked out. Nice. If oh. you want to read, uh, this is a good segue into this. If you want to read a story by Stephen Mark Graney for free, I published one in Lovecraft Easing years ago called beneath the pier remember that mark yeah 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 and i'll i'll try to remember to include a link to that in the show notes for the for the viewers and the listeners so cool thank you thank you well pete you had asked about uh, you know that was that was basically my introduction to lovecraft and of course the first few things i wrote when i first started uh writing stories were sort of along the lines of pastiche, but I knew right away I did not want to imitate Lovecraft. I simply wanted to capture that the, the cosmic horror. That's that's the part that, that got me. So except for anthologies and stuff where Lovecraftian uh, entities are sort of paramount, I usually try to shy away from those and come up with something that is uh, that's that's cosmic and may have some ties i might you know bring in some of the lovecraftian lore as a as a backdrop and mm -hmm. sometimes maybe even as a springboard but i i really really try to shy away from pastiche blue devil I, island is a good example of that yeah yeah and I, blue I, devil to, island yeah to be honest mark i have a whole shelf full of your stuff so you, you've done a great job well so. thanks and you're still talking to me wow yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you read? If you read, he doesn't the talk to you every week now. I don't know if you've read the monarchs that Dave published through uh, Crossroad, but I've had several people once they read that book. I never saw them again, man. They just. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a lot of that stuff in audio too on Balik that you mentioned before. We we've got a fairly popular audio book version of that, and Blue Devil Island introduced us to the narrator Joshua Saxon, who ended up being. Probably the best, yeah, best he's voice great. we've ever worked with. He he's really good. I liked him a who, lot. Who yeah. read Baylock? Was it the man, the person you just mentioned? No, it was Eric. No. Somebody. It, it goes um, back a ways. Then I'd have to go look. Eric. That okay, was a, that so was a Eric really long. Sines Vedetta. Yeah, Sineski. That wrong. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Sinisvetsky. Yeah. You know, Baylock being my first novel i find it rather embarrassing because it was just very self-indulgent but i'm glad to know that it scared matt man that makes my day <laughs> <laughs> david uh same question to you what was your first uh how what was your introduction to lovecraft um i had a stepbrother when i was really young that gave me some old lovecraft books and i and i had read them at that time but um i don't think i really got excited about it until around the time that I started reading Death Realm and then was introduced to Thomas Ligotti. And uh, I, I think much like Tony said, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of Lovecraft's writing on its own, but I love the style. And uh, then I, I kept saying that I don't write that kind of stuff, but I have an entire collection out that's that kind of stuff. <laughs> was it? Um, yeah, but it's that then, kind of but, stuff with your spin on it though. That's, you know. Yeah. Well, and I, I ended up in a lot of those anthologies where it was like a Clark Ashton Smith, tri you know, tribute. So there, there were things that were that way, but they, the stories that I wrote didn't have anything to do with, you know, the monsters that other people had done. Now, recently, 
recently I've been in a series of anthologies. Um, I think they called the Books of Cthulhu. And we do publish these, but I was invited outside of that. But I've involved my character, Cletus J. Diggs, and also Donovan DeChance in those stories. And I've wrote the Cletus J. Diggs and the Dun Huat Horror, bringing the Huatleys to uh, North Carolina. Working on one right now called The Feller and Yeller. <laughs> so that's nice. I've given some Lovecraft some redneck swing. Yeah, that, well, I, I like that. Uh, yeah, there, I, I got heavily out there called Eldritch Redneck. So it's <laughs> yeah, a I missed that one. I was a, I was a shoe in for that. <laughs> is, is that uh, is the feller and yeller? Is that a king and yellow reference? There? It's, it's, a hus, it's, it's supposed to be Hustor. Mine's based on Ambrose Bierce's original story. Oh, OK. okay. Have, Mark, have you read the book, um, The King and Old Yeller? <laughs> I have not. OK. There is a book. No, no, I was gonna. No, but gonna now say, if there's not, I wanted. If uh, not, yeah, <laughs> if there's not. There should be, right? There should be. It would be really sad. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, King and Yellow anthologies was uh, Glenn Owen Barris um, edited one called "In the Court of the Yellow King," and I have a story in that that I think is one of maybe one of my best uh, as far as the mood goes. Uh, called mask of the queen and it's to my mind i was sort of channeling a king and yellow story as if told by david lynch and i i had more fun Ooh, you know, wow. writing writing that than anything i'll have to I'd check that out mark i don't think i've gotten to that uh, yeah. okay okay it's Wait. actually in fugue devil if i'm not uh i'm yeah fugue devil uh research and i think it's in there I yeah it is it's, it's been a while since i read fugue devil so so uh, and of course there's Joe Pulver. Yeah. The King oh, of yeah. Yellow stuff, you know. To pick I too up. am in, in the court of the Yellow King. That's right. In the my shirt story, the Sip Sapia Prince, um, yeah. which eventually becomes uh the one of the, the first stories in Reanimatrix. Um anyway. Not to segue everything back to the Patreon, but for those <laughs> King and Yellow <laughs> fans out there. Um, we did a couple of years ago, Pete. We did a King and Yellow Patreon podcast. Um, I included show notes that you guys gave me. Here's what I wrote I would have paid a hundred dollars just to listen to Rick Lay, Pete Rollick, and Matthew Carpenter share their King and Yellow knowledge. Not trying to be hyperbolic, but it was absolutely incredible listening to them. So, yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I wanted to compliment you and Pete and Rick. It, that that's an amazing episode. So, anyway, go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. No, uh, you have a question for Alan because I am done. Uh, I have a question for Alan after we after we stop recording. Oh, oh, so, after we stop recording. So, yeah. I am done. I think I burned the hour, as as I've, I've been paid to do. Yeah, I'll get that. You too. paid to do. <laughs> um, la I guess the last thing I want to say about Death Realm Spirits, unless you guys have anything else that you want to ask or comment on, is just name a few of the authors. Joe Lansdale, uh, Linda Addison. Um, we mentioned Eric LaRocca. Is it LaRocca or LaRocca? I, I don't know. Might be LaRoche. Oh, okay. Um, Brian Keane, as you mentioned, Casey's in this. Casey Lansdale. Casey Lansdale. And, you know, uh, Richard, Richard uh, Thomas, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. There's some great writers in here. Every day when I sit down to, in my office, I put on my headphones, I turn on my playlist, and I am treated somewhere at random to three Casey Lansdale songs that I have added to my permanent. Well, the algorithm probably did that for you because we we talked no, to her that time no. i built this playlist this is my personal playlist mm. and i have taken three of casey's songs and they are on my permanent um they my, my permanent list so she's she's tell, tell me that black water song is on there that's black water songs on there yeah yeah she is just an all-around amazing talent she yeah. yeah she's a sweetheart she's very amazing she's a very kind person and she wrote 
I don't remember. I read it, but but she wrote a um, little article one time about, uh, you know, my dad is Batman. So that um, yeah. something like that. You know, her Joe, her dad is obviously Joe Lansdale, and um, it's a really cute article. I love it. So I hadn't read Casey's work prior to that, but uh, Joe sent me a note and he said, "Would you?" want to take a look at something that Casey wrote. So she sent me that story. Mm. I said, man, that one might be better than her dad right there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Did you tell Joe that? <laughs> I just... You should have. He'd like, he would have He would have probably agreed with you. <laughs> um, last week I was at um, uh, the comic convention Megacon in Orlando and I stood in line to get a, a signature from Arthur Sugum. The, he's the... Uh, he does a lot of zom- he does a Marvel Zombies books. And he, he's looking at my, he, he, I've got this tiny little package and I open it up and it's Joe Lansdale's Lost Tarzan novel, <laughs> which he did the cover for. And he's like, nobody brings me this. And, you know, we spent the next 20 minutes talking about Joe Lansdale and and how, you know, he has been pigeonholed as as a zombie guy, but he does a lot more work. Oh, he's done. He does so oh, much stuff. And but that's what he's become. I'm a happy letter fan. Yeah. He also wrote, um, and I've said this on the show before, but 1990, 1989, somewhere around in there, uh, there was a an anthology, a Batman anthology. Um, the further adventures of Batman, and um, I read it at the time. It's written a little differently, uh, but I've asked Joe since then about that, and he said it's just a style choice he went with at the time. The book is worth, if you're a Batman fan, especially the book is worth purchasing for that story alone. It's an amazing story, and it's tied in with the God of the Razor. So, oh, I did, I did read that way back when. Yes, yeah. I remember that. I probably read it ten times since then. That Subway Jack. Subway Jack, yes, is yeah. the title. Yeah, if you're if if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're a Batman fan, and or a Joe Lansdale fan, you got to get on. Amazon or eBay or wherever you go to get used books, a a books, right? And uh, and pick that up. So, do we want to say or comment? Um, speaking to everyone, anything else about Death Realm Spirits that that we didn't cover already, or did we did we cover everyone it's available? It. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I may have everyone. blown it all out. <laughs> uh. Did you say something, David? I'm sorry. Yeah, I said everyone should buy it. Yes, that there is true. Go. I was going to say it, it's next I'm 24 sure hours. Uh, yeah, see. it's available in Kindle and print. And we are recording this on February the 11th, 2024. And even if you're listening three months from now or whenever, um, Alan, what's it going to go back up to on Kindle? Uh, normal price is $4.99 for the ebook. That's still a great price. Yeah, so if, if you want, can't even get a glass of wine from that. <laughs> uh, I'll just, yeah. just make a comment to collectors out there. Yes, you just never know when these small press books go out of print. You need a cop if you want a copy for yourselves. If you know you're the kind of guy who likes to have a copy of of Stephen Mark Rainey's work, or you've got a shelf devoted, you got to get it now because there's no guarantee a year from now you're going to be able to pick up a copy i i just know that there are certain books i wish i'd picked up ages ago and now i i can't get them That's and if great. you buy it please please leave reviews all all reviews are always welcome yes. yeah especially reviews on amazon mm-hmm. are seem to help more than anything i'm not saying amazon's the where, where you need to go um to buy all your books i'm not saying anything like that just saying that it really helps sales yeah and you when you review also it helps you get promotions and other sites yeah 
Yeah, what, what, one note on that for, for anyone who is considering picking it up. To get the branded box and all the extras, you have to buy directly from Shortwave. That doesn't come with the Amazon version or Barnes & Noble version. You're going to get just the That's print paper back in Okay. Yeah, I'm, so I just, just wanted to point that, that out. I'm glad you said that. And that's shortwavepublishing.com. Correct, yes. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, Alan, you'll be sending me my copy gratis, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got the book, but I don't have the cover thing. But I'm, 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 I'm just being, uh, I'm just being facetious. I have, I have a, almost I, it, all those boxes. Yeah, it's in, it's signed by, by Mark, so I'm happy. So it is suitably devalued. Yeah, and Matt's advice—that's really good advice. And you know, he's been around a few hundred years, and he's got the wisdom that accumulates with that. So, yeah. Nothing. Yeah, I don't see how anybody can have all those books. <laughs> I have so, so many I, I couldn't find the other Death Realm. I was going to show the other Death Realms anthology that he talked about, and I know it's here, but I couldn't find it. Uh, I think it, <laughs> I've got it downstairs. I'm not going to go yeah. digging for it. I got a copy somewhere. I can't find it either. Yeah, that was a beautiful book, though. Very well so, produced. You're telling me that I'm the only person that went and dug through their library to find something related to Death Realm? Uh, okay. basically yes thank you hey i'm related I, I, to death realm you got me well i have a complete well, run of the know. magazine over here hey, i am mr death realm. nice mr. Death realm. so so wait mark who dug you up then <laughs> i'll never okay. tell so i don't know it, david and and alan and and tony i don't know if you guys inflict this podcast on yourselves and and know the format or anything but if you if you haven't then what we usually do after we talk to the guests is we spend a little bit more time on on other topics and um so thank you for being here and two things you're very very welcome to stay for a little while and, and talk with us about those things or you're absolutely if you got things you need to do um you know it you can bow out whatever you guys want to do you're but i do want you to know that you're welcome so thank, thank you. you for being here i'm good for about 20 more minutes so okay. all right uh for a while. And thank you here. mike for having me in this capacity as opposed to just the uh the regular weekly weirdo yeah absolutely and and pete thank you um so, i so know what? that rick and matt um and probably some of the rest of you would like to spend, you know, three to five minutes about on Brian Lumley. So yeah, that that'd be great. Um, yeah. Let's take it away. He uh, is uh, of the generation of Ramsey Campbell, is how I would put it. Um, he didn't start out as a writer. He, as a young man, to try and make ends meet, he joined the Royal Military Police in Britain. And he actually served in various hotspots around the world. Um, I think I saw a photograph of him in a military vehicle writing notes. Um, he started being interested in writing while he was doing this. He put in like 20 plus years. And when he got started out, uh, he had said he very much depended upon his pension to help <laughs> help survive because they sure. were making pennies. This was in the, the 70s. And so he started off writing no experience, no training. He just liked to write, and he started writing essentially pastiches and pulp stories, very imitative and sending them out. And just like Ramsey Campbell had sent stories to uh, August Derleth, uh, Lovecraft stories, and then got a book, I believe uh, at least some of uh, uh, Brian Lumley's original publications were through Arkham House via the Lovecraft connection. So he he certainly had at the beginning these pastiches kind of stories he would write, but he was always very original. One of his earlier stories that most of us read when we were baby Lovecraft readers was Cement Surroundings. It's not seen print that much lately, which is a shame. I don't think it was in the Book of Cthulhu or uh, other similar anthologies. It's sort of like his 70s wave kind of story but then he decides you know it's like the lovecraft gave us these names i'm gonna do what the hell i want 
and that's when he started uh, his own series of stories with the basically investigator adventurer Titus Crow. Um, and uh, he was getting a little bit of success this way, a little bit more name recognition. Um, and most of his Lovecraft stuff was early in his career. And then he wrote uh, uh, Necroscope. Um, now, I saw a publication date for it, 1982, and then there was another one like 1986. I don't know which is accurate, but it was like mid-80s, he writes Necroscope, and in horror paperback novel terms, it's a smash. And when it was released in America, it was a big hit, and he then suddenly made a lot of money, and he was off to the races, you know? So started off with Lovecraft, then used Lovecraft I, names and ideas, but did what the hell he wanted, which was more pulp fiction time like Robert E. Howard. And then he got into more general and vampire horror. And that's where he had his greatest success. He was apparently always very friendly to talk to at conventions. He liked corresponding with fans, very approachable. He was also humble. Um, I, I, I don't think he ever was said to have a big ego. Once he said something to the effect that like, Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I like Lovecraft, but my characters, they like to fight back, and they like to have a laugh upon the, along the way. You know, so if you, you go in to his work, don't expect that you're going to read something, even if he initially was leaning on Durlis' interpretation of Lovecraft, don't expect anything like anyone else. He's using the names, but most of what he writes isn't cosmic horror. It's it's right. like, it, it would it'd be something that... Uh, you wouldn't be surprised if John Carter ran into this into the frame, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a shame that he died, but he had a lengthy career and uh, a lot of recognition. He won lifetime achievement from the British Fantasy Awards. You know, he had uh, uh, good financial success. Uh, he got to travel a lot. He and his wife, I think, were pr are really pretty happy. So. Uh, it's more like we can celebrate that we had Brian Lumley as a writer than be sad that he's gone. Hey, hey Matt, before I get beat to it, uh, Cement Surroundings was last published in 2019 by Crossroad Press. Hmm. Oh, in what? Uh, Hagopian and other stories. We've we've actually oh, okay. all, that was, all uh, those old Arkham House like, books. Those were, uh, sorry, I those originally came out, I think, Subpress uh, from subterranean, and that's the issue I got. And it was yep. expensive and pretty, and I thought practically no one picked it up. I didn't realize it came out as a, a, a yeah, paper uh, paper. David. I was just going to say we we've got all those old Arkham House titles back in at least Kindle, and we've started bringing stuff back in in print. We also okay. just published the best of the rest, which is the very very first publication of that book as a collection that just came out like. We we found out while we were proofreading it that that Brian had passed. So um, that's that amazing um, that you have all of that. I'm, yeah, all the Titus Crow books and yeah. In addition to a link to Death Realm Spirits, um, guys, I'm going to link to um, Alan's uh, press, Shortwave Publishing, your press, David, um, Crossroad um, Press dot com. Is that right? Yeah crossroadpress.com singular so by the yeah. time he got by the time i started going being active in fandom and going to conventions he had stopped didn't travel out of the uk anymore except for whatever holidays he was going on so i never did get to meet him at a convention do you think that he stopped because he heard that you were starting to go to them yeah, probably <laughs> <laughs> so uh did any of you all get to meet him I, I, not, I, I met, him, met, him. met him several times uh, at yeah. various cons back, probably in the, I'm thinking early 90s, maybe. <laughs> I know Rick wants to say some words about Brian Lumley. Yeah. Um, he wrote more, uh, I think there are two phases to his work. One of the Titus Crows phase, which is sort of a road of car, and uh, concerning. Uh, Cement surroundings, that's also when the borough was beneath. It was the, when he got his contract from, uh, I think it was Door Books. He had to do three novels, and he incorporated some of the short stories he had written from Arkham House in the novel. 
But after the Titus Crow, the Zechor Crow, which is the more frightening of the two phases. And if you compare the two phases together, you see that Titus Crow is sort of a rough draft for Necroscope. And that you have uh, time travel in the Titus Crow, which is with the clock from uh, Through the Gates of the Silver Key, which is, it kind of makes it the equivalent of uh, Doctor Who's TARDIS. Yeah. But when he goes into Necroscope, he's got this thing called the Morbius Continuum. Which is a little like he was in a witch house. But he also has a time loop in both, which was the original conclusion of the Necroscope series. The Necroscope was so popular, he uh, wrote a lot of. Uh, stories that occur in gaps in Necroscope. And he may have exhausted the themes that he was using there. The Necroscope has a um, Cthulhu Mythos connection in that Charles Dexter Ward and in one novel he uses one of his own uh, Great old ones, uh, Summon Us, which is based on a, a real life god who was worshipped in Britain. But Necroscope is a great achievement. And then he combined espionage and horror very effectively. Probably influenced a little bit by Dennis Wheatley, but he was better at combining those two elements than Wheatley ever was. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Anything else about Lumley before we move on? So I did meet Lumley, um, <clears throat> I think at Dragon Con in my, before my son was born, so it would have been late late nineties, um, before ninety nine, um, and I had a bathtub of books for him to sign, and <laughs> but you could only get like five things signed at a time, and then you had to get back in line. <laughs> so I'm going around and around with my suitcase of books. And like the last one, he's like, now I know I've signed them all. And he's <laughs> exasperated. He's like, you got to go buy me a drink now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, I met yeah, of course I did. Yeah. I met him in the early 80s. He had a big party there. But Tor, I think it was Tor or Dog, whoever did the, the Necroscope books had a publishing party. And uh, they let him give away a whole big pile of those books. And I ended up there and I met this other British guy who turned out to be Phil Nutman, who I also didn't know at the time. And uh, he dragged me from party to party, and there was beer in the bathtub. So it was a nice segue from your bathtub full of books. <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne Olson also had a few stories about how he and Brian Lumley like, closed down parties into the wee hours at like uh, Necronomicon conventions. So it sounds to me like the guy was really pretty lively, very approachable successful and not overwrought about it and talented yeah. no you well, I'm at, my memories of brian are somewhat hazy because my god did we drink yeah. <laughs> he made that punch there's some famous punch that he always made and it had like everything yeah. in it. it was what i think it was whatever was there well i'd like to recommend a couple of books first of all um one is called replay by Ken Grimwood. That's an old book. I know. Okay. I know. Why? Why am I recommending it? Because it's a good book. I okay. I no. I. It's a I, good. Yeah. Necroscope is an old book too. Yeah. Good point. 
Uh, replay asks the provocative question, what if you could live your life over again, knowing the mistakes you'd made before? 43-year-old Jeff Winston gets several chances to do just that. Uh, trapped in a tepid marriage and a dead-end job, he dies in 1988 and wakes up to find himself in 1963 at the age of 18, staring at his dorm room walls. It's all the same but different because Jeff knows, knows what the future holds. He knows who, who will win every World Series, every Kentucky, Kentucky Derby, even how to win on Wall Street. One thing he does not know is, why has he been chosen to replay his life? And how many times must he win and lose everything that he loves? Now, when I first picked this book up years ago off of a shelf, I thought, I don't know, this could turn out to be pretty hokey. But it's not. It's, a, it's an extremely well-written book and trust me if you if you get started on this book you won't be able to put it down it also reminds me of a newer book about 10 years old pete called the first 15 lives of harry august have you read that one yeah i've read that that's pretty good that's damn good that's by clara north Harry August is on his deathbed again, no matter what he does or the decisions he makes when death comes. Harry always returns to where he began, a child with all the knowledge of a life he has already lived a dozen times before. Nothing ever changes until now. Um, each time he does live his life different. But as Harry nears the end of his 11th life, a little girl appears at his bedside. I nearly missed you, Dr. August, she says. I need to send a message. And the message is, this really isn't a spoiler because it happens really early. The world is ending. This is the story of what Harry does next and what he did before and how he tries to save a past he cannot change and a future he cannot allow. Harry, uh, Harry is not the only one who lives his life over and over again. In fact, there's a, there's a club of people who who get together in each life and they have they have a base and everything. And this little girl who appears at his bedside and says, I almost missed you. Of course, she means before you died. But this little girl is another one who's, you know, has the cumulative a lifetime of hundreds and hundreds of years. So it is a really, really good book. And Claire North is a is a wonderful writer. And if you haven't read these two books, they're, they're pretty similar, but different in a lot of ways. And uh, you really should read them. I highly recommend them. So, what like is some you... TV series like that? The, the... Done for a comedy. Which one was that? I, I don't remember. I remember a TV series with, with a plot like that. Huh. It was done comedically. Yeah. It was, it was a kid who had lived an earlier life. Yeah, but we knew how uh, Empire Strikes Back <laughs> or anybody else. So it was, it was. Did he know how bad the the prequels were going to be? Because that's the important knowledge that you need to have. You know, when you when you relive your life. Okay, it came out before the Star Trek prequels. <laughs> uh, have, you, uh, have you watched yeah. the Devil's Hour with Peter Capaldi? I have. Yes, it's so, similar. Really. Very similar take, but done as the serial killer thing, right? Which you know, in, in the context, suddenly makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> there there are some plot holes in that in that TV series that I won't get into right, right. now, but I did enjoy it a lot. Yeah. So, um, a listener, Stephen Ward, wants to know, Mike, because I can't remember. Mike, was there ever a Lovecraft Easy podcast episode that goes into detail about the King and Yellow, Carcosa, and Legati influence on True Detective Season 1? Thanks. Well, we talked about True Detective Season 1 10 years ago, I vaguely remember. But um, I don't know if there's an episode focused on the King and Yellow influence on it. We talked about it a lot. Didn't we? we? Did, but casu casually, 
Yeah. Um, I don't think we that, focused any one episode on it. No. But yeah. I can't remember. You'd probably, you probably you might you would. Rick. Here's what I'm going to suggest to you, Mike. Yeah. Let's finish this season, and then let's do let's take a month to to relax, think about it, and then like maybe in April, let's right. do a, a episode on the on True Detective. Is right. True Detective only on HBO? Yeah, mm. I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me say a couple things oh, about True yeah. Detective. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed True Detective season one, plagiarism notwithstanding, and <laughs> all the hate I got about that. Kind of vindicating that even those who disagreed at the time agree now. However, forget Nick Pizzolatto for a second. I did enjoy it all the way up to the end, which I thought was a real letdown, and a lot of people seem to agree. I couldn't get into season two or three. Now, all of that said, I am really enjoying season four, True Detective Night yes. Country. I am loving it. And, you know, you almost cannot go wrong with Jodie Foster, first of all. But it's just really, really good. And a couple of things on that. Usually they drop the episodes on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. Then I noticed yesterday that episode five was already on HBO Max. Yeah, it dropped Friday night. Yeah. We didn't want to compete with Super Bowl. Yeah. I figured. Yeah. 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 Um, so so there's that. If you're not aware of that, you can watch episode five. And um the soundtrack to Night Country is really great too. If you go to Spotify, there are already some Night Country playlists. And um yeah. Yeah, check them out. I think that besides talking about true, true Detective in general, as you suggested, Pete, um, I'd like to do a spoiler-filled discussion soon of Night Country after everyone's had a chance to see it. Because I think it's great. Yeah. I really do. So um, Mandy wants to go back and, and re-watch the first season, which she did not watch the first time around. Mm. And uh, we, I actually, I actually own it on DVD, um, but uh, we have Max right now, so we can watch all, all the seasons. Right. Um, the funny thing is that you, know, while two and three were kind of a letdown, there was another show that came out about that the, that same time that I really, really enjoyed mm -hmm. that I thought you could have slapped the true detective name on and been perfectly happy. And it was called, uh, it was an adaption of Jillian, Jillian Flynn's novel, Jillian Flynn, uh, Sharp Objects. Yes. And uh, is there, I didn't realize that there was some paranormal in that. There isn't. Okay. Um, But there's nothing about true, you know, seasons two and three of true detective, you know, not, necessarily paranormal well um, certainly seems like there is we'll in we'll, this season yes we'll figure it out. I, laird yeah. said something to me the other day about you know microscopic what he basically said what you said that that's going to be he thinks that's what it's going to be and i was like yeah pete said that too and he said i hope you're wrong but <laughs> who knows it's still a good story and uh yeah the um one more week and we can we can have a discussion about it so but i mean yeah i'm gonna take off all right I thank just you tony. thanks for coming tony oh, thanks for tony really glad to see you Bye, tony yeah yes, we're almost yeah. done anyway so thank you for being here oh thank you for inviting me i had a great time i and while i got him i just want to thank uh dave for the uh, audiobook that was uh, that was great. So thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, we'll see you guys. Have a good nice night. Take it easy, man. Yeah. Bye. Um.
have you guys seen i just have a couple more things have you guys seen the movie uh, edge of tomorrow yes. tom cruise and yeah, Emily loved Blunt. It. yeah i loved it yeah. too it's uh, not that all right pete and anyone what? else who wants to reply i have a question and it leads sure. into a segue i'm going to segue into my personal life after this Every time Tom Cruise dies, yeah, does that reset everything, or is that a par? Does the that parallel reality go on without him? What? In other words, when he finally saves the day, is it only in one timeline slash reality, or does the world stop when Emily Blunt shoots him in the head? Does the world stop for everybody else and go back to that day? Yeah, I I, I would probably think about it as as alternate uh, timelines and that he's only saving one of them just because yeah. that's the easiest to make sense in my head. Yeah. We've got a lot more stories if it's not true, though. <laughs> like, what's going on with everybody else? Everybody else sucks. Everyone <laughs> else is screwed. Yeah, they're not yeah. covered by the news. I, I, I mean, the, the Hollywood ending is no there are no other alternate timelines but i wonder you know what do you think pete uh, i'd have to think about it but i i might fall back on my this is a a local time phenomenon mm -hmm. so it's only affecting say our solar system yeah i'll and buy that i'm just maybe. wondering if there are other timelines yeah, so I would say no. You would say, okay, so you're going to disagree with Alan. Well, okay, so because it's not, you know, remember, this is their power that he's stolen. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it wouldn't make, basically, they're winning every single time here. Um, That's a good point. You know, so... That's a good point. That this is how they win. Right. Means that um under some circumstances, a lot of circumstances, they have to learn how to win and how to use this power. So possibly very early on in these 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 battles, they lose. And we're only seeing like say the last five thousand battles where they're winning. Right. And Tom Cruise interrupts those last battles towards the end. Right. So, okay. um, yeah, it's I, a f it's, it's a fun film. It's it's a fun film. Again, it would be a huge, and I make this argument in previous episodes. It's a huge amount of energy from a cosmic viewpoint to sustain all those universes that are only very very slightly different. Yeah. It may not make any difference to an outside observer in five years. Yeah, we're in the Andromeda galaxy right now. Right, right. Yeah, okay. So uh, anyway. I yesterday was my 29-year, our 29-year anniversary, Danielle and I, of not our marriage, but the day that we met. At the bully alley. At the bowling alley. Okay. Very cold, very snowy night, February 10th, 1995. And it was called Rock and Bowl because it was, it, it started at midnight, if I remember correctly. So, I, I, if anyone cares, I'll link to this on, on Facebook. But basically, this beautiful girl came over and started talking to me. Um, accused me of being too young to be drinking the, the beer that I was drinking and carded me jokingly because uh, believe it or not, uh, I had a young face almost 30 years ago. So, um, and we, you know, we talked her, she and her friends were in the next bowling lane and my friends and I were in the, in the lane and we talked, you and had as I, huh? Yeah, I had friends. friends. Yeah. Right. At the time. Yeah. At the time. And uh, two, I had two friends with me at the time. So I, I, I was cool, Pete, I'm telling you. Anyway, she was with a couple of friends. They were bowling. 
she also made fun of my bowling. Um, anyway, we had fun. We were talking. And as I wrote on Facebook, she said goodbye at the end and smiled and started walking away with her friends. And I thought, if I let this go, I will never see this girl again. Never. And I just had a feeling. I went and asked her for her phone number. Uh, I still have the original sheet of paper. I posted it on Facebook and she gave it to me. And years later, after we were married, she told me, oh, by the way, when when guys would ask my friends and, and me for our phone numbers, we would give them fake numbers, you know, so no confrontation, just, you know, give them fake numbers so that these mm -hmm. guys aren't calling us. Well, she gave me a real number. So I, th I think she had a feeling too, but here's my, you could have read all that on my Facebook. My point is this, there was a hell of a lot that had to happen for us, us to meet. I was working at a pizza place at the time I was 23 and a friend of mine stopped by, you know, I worked there. I hadn't seen this friend in years. His name was Derek. And he said, you know, Charlie and I um, are going to go bowling. Do you want to go with us? I'd, I'd been bowling like three times in my life. And I'm like, sure, why not? However, I was closing that night, which meant I would be working until like one in the morning and I wouldn't be able to go. So I asked a co-worker, his name is Chad. I said, will you close for me tonight so I can go out with my friends? And he's, he said, sure. Okay, so stop there for a second. First of all, if Derek had never came and asked me to bowl, I never would have met Danielle. Secondly, Chad very easily could have said, no, I, I've got something to do. You, you're scheduled to close. You need to close. And I, would have, I wouldn't have gotten mad. I would have just said, you know what? You're right. That's fine. We went bowling. Danielle and her friends could very well, it was a big, it was a big bowling alley. She could very well have been on the far other far side of the, of the, uh, of, of the bowling alley. And I never would have bumped into her. And just so many things had to match up. I, I won't get into all of them here because I'll probably bore everyone with my romantic crap. But I think about that all the time about how just one little thing could have happened and we would have never met, you know, along the way, this chain of, event, of events had to be perfect. And I've just given you three or four of them and not, not the rest of them. So it's an interesting thing to talk about. And I think about is, is there a, is there a Mike Davis in another reality where Chad told him, no, you need to close tonight. And so I never went bowling with, with Derek and Charlie and met, never met Danielle. Um, I thought you were going to ask how many times you had to come back and go through that whole evening to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I did okay, you know. Yeah. And don't discount the fact that you're so cool, Mike. I was? Well, so I hear. Oh, who told you that? Pete? Not, just me. <laughs> Not me. It wasn't me. <laughs> Kelly. Oh, I know who told you that. It was Kelly Young, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. 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 He's a big fan. Uh, kidding. He's a good friend of mine. Harlan anyway. Ellison. Yeah. Sorry. So it was Harlan Ellison. <laughs> <laughs> he had good stuff to say about everybody. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, I wanted to comment about yesterday i'm i'm very happily married and she puts up with my being a square peg or that doesn't fit into round holes or vice versa just to and i do stuff like this because she supports me so well ha happy adversity such as it is yes adversity adver <laughs> adver adver, adver ad no never mind yeah, maybe, it, maybe we can call it a me diversity when we first. Yeah, met. Kim and I have a kiss anniversary. Really? Oh, oh yeah. Um, if Tony was still here, I'd have him tell you the story about how I got engaged to Trish because he was heavily involved and it was crazy. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice. nice. Had to get a giant crystal ball in a bowling bag from Salem, 
Massachusetts and get it to me shipped in time. Really? Yeah, it was an adventure. She she fell in love with it when we were there, but it was too expensive. And I didn't want to spend all our vacation money on this crystal ball. So we got back and instead of getting an engagement ring, I contacted the store. They said they'd sell it. Tony went over there with a bowling ball bag that I bought off Amazon and stuck this giant crystal ball in it and rolled it back to his car. <laughs> had it in his basement because his wife would have been upset that they had this big crystal ball from a witch shop in the basement. And, uh, <laughs> It's a great it story. To me and then we it was a complete surprise we it was my business christmas party and we had it up on a big stand with a light and my daughter and i went into another room and changed into a tuxedo and i came out and yeah it was fun that's a that's a great story that's Tony's cool. my hero so uh anyway anything else before we go guys yes okay i have some shameless self-promotion Shame on you. So a few years ago, there was the Starry Wisdom Collection auction right. book from Nate Peterson. Right. Great book. Yes. As I am told, PS Publishing is is shipping out the latest version, the Dagon, the newest, newest uh, uh, sequel of the Dagon Collection. Right. Um, uh, so that should be winding its way to people who have ordered or or need to order uh, as i speak dedicated to joe i hear it is dedicated to joe pulver that's wonderful at the same time glenn owen barass and Byron m sammons have published a ps publishing uh collection of um mythos mysteries called mystery murder madness and mythos hmm. and that uh, should good. be shipping soon as well. So, and I that has a new uh, Herbert West story in it for me. I've Fun. heard of that guy, Herbert West. Yeah, yeah. Published a couple of those. He's kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he Wait, is. Wait, what are you, Pete? <laughs> I, I was. I, no, I was not talking about Pete. <laughs> I mean, it's Herbert West story. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway. where can we get those, Pete? Are they uh, PS out? PS Publishing. PS Publishing. Are they out yet? Uh, I believe they're taking pre-orders, but shipping, they're in stock. Okay. So it'll just take some time to, sh to ship. Well, I'll say again how important pre-orders are to, to uh, publishers, editors, and, and writers. So if you know you're going to get the book anyway, yeah, pre-order it. Anyway, Alan... David, Mark, um, everyone, thanks for being here. Thank you. Yep. Very much appreciate it. Yeah. DeBronzo, I, I try not to take over the episode next week with your in, incessant chatter, if you would. I'd appreciate that. It's not the quantity. Ah, that's the quality. true. That's and true. there's none of that today. So I'll just... I, I have a dad joke as I finish, if you want want me to tell it. Sure. Yeah, uh, have you heard of, you, you know, you've heard about the rise of self-driving automobiles, right? That's, that's yeah. going to happen sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, and I didn't make this up. It's only a matter of time till a guy writes a country song about his truck leaving him. I know that's bad. That's a dad joke. Get out. Matt of Carpenter would be so proud of you right now if you he, hadn't left. He would. He I, would I do be. that. Matt told that joke on his no. daily joke. Like, well, then he got it, it from me because I found it somewhere else. <laughs> it's like years old. Is it? No, it's not. So <laughs> yes, it's me too many years old. Is yes, it? It is. Well, I yeah, I I can be behind the times a little bit. Anyway, everybody, guys, thanks for being here. Good to see all of you. And um, my apologies to Kelly Young. We ran out of time, but maybe we'll get him on next week. So uh, <laughs> what are you laughing at? Uh, yeah. I got to go call Kelly and you know, be on his podcast. <laughs> all right. 
Thanks, everybody, and uh, we will see you next time.